On behalf of Globant, good morning to everyone that has joined us today. Uh, and welcome to our uh, webinar that is called uh, Helping Businesses Thrive with AI and Augmented Coding. Um, we will discuss things around AI for code and augmented coding, along with uh, what tools and techniques we can use that promote quick development and high quality software. My name is Haldo Sponton, and I'm the Vice President of Technology and Head of AI for Globant. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to this extraordinary session in which I have the privilege to be here with uh, Guido Pusiol, uh, one of the, I think, most relevant and articulate voices on AI and augmented coding. Uh, Guido has a PhD in AI in Stanford University and a vast experience in research and entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley. We have the pleasure of having Guido in our team as the Managing Director of Augmented Coding. For those who are not familiar with us, with, with Globant, let me give you just a, a little flavor of, of who, who we are. Uh, we are a digitally native company, as we like to say, uh, leading in cognitive innovation and digital transformation. We operate in 18 countries and we have around 17,000 people, 17,000 passionate tech professionals. We partner with many leaders to help organizations uh, with their digital transformation journeys and to become future-centric organizations. At Globant, we are reinventing the professional services industry. It's not just about technology and software products, but it's also about the human capabilities, such as creativity and culture that are essential in successful organizations. Uh, the experience of working you know, with Globant, the experience of, of working with us is quite different to traditional software suppliers. In today's webinar, me and Guido will take you into the concepts and techniques of AI and augmented coding uh, and what you can do as businesses to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, if you have any questions, just a reminder while listening, uh, please feel free to share them via the Q&A box in Zoom. After the talk, we will move to the Q&A uh, and we will basically have the, the um, uh, uh, coming going with, uh, with Guido trying to answer all your questions and exchange your ideas uh, with myself and Guido. So without any further ado, let's jump right into the session. Guido, welcome, and the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Aldo, and thank you for a nice introduction. Uh, I'll do the same uh, with you a little bit. Uh, well, Aldo uh, is a genius. He has been the pioneer and the founder of this project uh, almost two years ago, when he started realizing some problems that happen internally in companies. He has a background in mathematics. Uh, in the academic world, and uh, later on, he joined jo uh, joined uh, Global and has been helping and thinking about how to solve certain problems that were observable at the time, but got stronger over time. And, and all, those are the things that we're tackling right now. So to go straight forward to what we want to show you, you can go to the first slide. And here are a couple of issues that we have been observing for a while now. The, the amount of developers that we have today in the world is around 27 million and is going to grow to 45 million in 2030. So this is a huge amount of growth. Uh, it's even exponential. But at the same time, we have that the demand for these developers is growing even faster than the amount of uh, developers that the world can produce. So we need better tools to join the gap between human labor and the tasks and things we want to do with uh, software development. On top of that, we have that given the amount of projects and, and technology that's been developed, many of the traditional uh, company issues are getting even bigger and harder to tackle. Among them, we can see that uh, we, we classified some of them there, which is legacy projects, uh, priority shifts, migrations, maintenance, uh, onboarding problems when you, your team gets growing and uh, reskilling rain pups and a huge, huge amount of issues in the speed of communication and the quality of communication in big teams. So given all these problems, we started actually thinking and developing a platform or a, uh, an umbrella of tools, which is called method coding. You can go to the next slide. Here to define and, and to tell you which is our mission here with augmented coding is actually very simple. It's how do we make the process of coding simpler and faster 
in a cost-effective way, certainly, because we will introduce new technology. But all of this, we need to do it without jeopardizing the quality of the code. Actually, even better, we want to improve the quality of the code while speeding it up. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So what is it exactly, a method coding? Is this ecosystem of AI-based tools that will augment engineers in the process of developing software. Uh, and for doing that, we go to the next slide. It's not probably as easy as it sounds. Uh, let me first tell you why we are developing tools to tackle the problems that we are servicing the companies. We, we actually realized that many of the issues like onboarding and uh, uh, migrations and uh, several of the, of the things I mentioned before actually are very difficult to tackle directly. And all of them were coming from the way uh, coding is performed. So we decided that if we help developers to perform better, we are going to be able to solve these problems as a collateral. And for doing that uh, in augmented coding, we have and we built our uh, we, we are based on state of the art natural language processing algorithms and you know, AI, uh, which try to understand coding in a semantic way. And which one is that relation with the human language or the natural way humans understand uh, a task or a piece of code? So let's go to the next slide. Uh, our secret sauce, if you want, or our, our main differentiator is that we have a huge amount of data and we have data coming from our clients and our task here is to build AI models or AI technologies tailored to particular needs of the client based on their data. So this way we are basically if you want we are doing one tool for each one of our clients and the other thing is that our algorithms are ad hoc. Uh, if you go and take off the shelf algorithms from uh, the public ones uh, that are there uh, online that are coming mostly from academia, they're going to fall short to address the particular issues that you have in a certain company. Because if they are not designed actually for working fast or uh, for deploying in a good way, and in some cases, you need to understand very well your domain of data to make better algorithms to uh, optimize the way they are going to be deployed and work in a real world environment. So today, what we are going to show you of all the tools that we are building are three that we already have in production. So that we can go to the next slide. One is called semantic code search. Uh, so put yourselves in the shoes of a new incomer, for example, having to speed up uh, uh, with an ongoing project where the code documentation is clattered or inexistent. If we don't know how to search this code base, we end up doing what? Constantly pinging uh, the project experts, taking them away from their other important jobs that they're doing, they're doing, and we are asking them how or where is this piece of code? So with semantic search, what we can do is to perform natural queries towards a code base, that, the code base of a company inside the company that is unstructured. And we can extract the meanings from those codes and map it to the natural queries that the developer is doing. This way, we put technology between the expert and the new incomer, for example. Similarly, it happens for experts that wants to understand or to learn about pieces of code that are being built by other teams. Uh, we're gonna talk about each one of these things in detail later. But uh, let me go to the second one. It's, it's called Semantic Deep Learning Autocomplete. And here is a tool that works directly in the IDE at every time the developer is pressing a keystroke. We try to guess what's gonna be the next line of code. And we propose them what should be that line of code. In this way, we are coaching them and we are making them type faster. Uh, this normally you would see in IDEs uh, where they use an R type of technology, but with the AI and the amount of data we have, we realize that we can go much better and much longer in the amount of completions we can do. Aldo is gonna explain that later. And a third and a very recent tool that we have deployed and put into production 
is the automatic code documentation. This tool, what, it, it, what it's doing is documenting and commenting functions for you, basically, while you are developing. Developers hate this part. Nobody likes documenting when they're finished their day. So with this tool, we're trying to help them do that. And working offline, we can go through databases of code that has never been documented and documenting them. This way, by documenting new code or existing code, uh, we help in many of the big problems with companies. One of them has to do with finding the right code, but another one that's even more important is when you have legacy projects that needs to be moved forward. Uh, so with all those things said, those are the th three demos that we're going to show you today, how they work. We're going to be going little details of uh, how they are built. Um, we can go to the next slide and there. Yeah, okay, I will do the, the quick introduction of what semantic search is and the problem here. So formally, uh, well, as I mentioned before, semantic search has to do with retrieving information in unstructured databases that are not commented. Uh, with natural language. And uh, here are a couple of things that I want to highlight. One of them is uh, like if you have to guess how much time a software engineer uh, or a software expert uh, spends coding, it's quite low actually, it's between five to 28%. So what we want to do is not to make them code more, but to make them code more efficiently. And for that, they need sometimes to find pieces of code that uh, are already existing uh, or being created by other people. And the other thing here is when the team gets bigger, and this is called the Brooks Law, uh, the communication between teams gets harder and harder in an exponential way. So with our tool, what we can do is do that. like reduce the amount of communication needed by searching and finding pieces of code, but in a completely different way to what you are probably used to, uh, to know. So with that said, I will let now Aldo to go through all the demos and all the details, because actually what is interesting to see is when you see things working in life and how they work in the real life. So thank you, and we'll come back later. Uh -huh. Aldo, please take the, take the stage. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Guido. And uh, the first demo we're going to see, and we have a video, but I prefer to do this demo live, is the demo of a semantic search. Uh, as Guido was mentioning in this first part in the semantic search, the objective of the algorithms is to understand code and understand natural language. But let me just highlight that term. You know, the word understand in this context is a little bit different that the way we understand the concept of understanding. And I know, I, I know this sounds like a, a little game of words, and it is, but uh, the idea of these algorithms is to actually being able to capture the meaning, the semantics of a piece of information and represent that information in a way that computationally, I can compare that information with the semantics of another piece of information. Um, in text, uh, it's, you, you may refer to algorithms such as uh, the vectorization of words in which you basically can measure the distance in a vector space and that distance will be equivalent to the difference in meaning between words. We do the same for code. We basically train a system uh, to understand the concept of a piece of code given the context on where that piece of code is living and interacting and connected with. And that's the idea. So let me just jump right to the demo. Uh, when, the, when the users, when they start using augmented coding, the first they see when they are using the web interface for our system is just a search bar. It's nothing more, nothing less than that. But the thing is that they can do pretty much everything with this search bar. The idea is, as Guido mentioned, we want to shorten the gap between human language and programming language. So uh, the idea is for users to actually, they don't have to use any keywords or they don't have to know business specifics behind the code or something like that. They ha just have to express the functionality they are looking for in the best way possible, in the, in the, the same way they are thinking of that functionality. 
for example, and it will start pretty low. This will not surprise anyone, but I want to, this example to be, you know, incremental. So I will start very simple with, with something like sort elements in a list. And for this demo, I have some Java code in the back. So of course, if I do a, a, a search a query like sort elements in a list, of course, I will get a lot of sort algorithms in my code base. This is again, this will not surprise anyone, but just for you to have a little grasp of the interface and the things that are happening here. Uh, we support many languages. Today we will see um, things in Java, but we support many languages. So let's jump to, or, let, or let's say, let's separate a little bit the concept of the functionality that I'm looking for from the actual words that describe that functionality or a function that could implement that. So for example, if I do something like check if a sentence can be read backwards, something like that, and sorry, I misspelled read, I will get a first um, and most relevant result that is a function that is checking if a string, uh, an object string, a text is a palindrome. And that's basically the definition of what I'm searching for. Uh, you know, I'm searching for a checking if a sentence can be read backwards, and that's basically the definition of a palindrome. If you see here, um, uh, and unless this function has a, pre, a piece of documentation, a Java doc in this case, but if you see here, we are not using any of these words that I'm using here. So, so this is the power of the uh, language models that we have in the back. Language models that are representing the meaning of my query, representing the meaning or the functionality of this piece of code and matching them together. And I'm not trying to bore you with this, but let me just show you a little bit of what is happening under the hood. Again, the power of these models, of these AI models, is actually converting pieces of code and pieces of text into points in a space. The thing is that those points in that, in that space are uh, capturing the semantics and the meaning of the code and the text, depending on, on which we are converting. So if I, I, we have here basically all my code in my project, in my organization, and this code is represented in a, in a cloud of points, you know, given the captured functionality using these algorithms. And if I zoom in here where I have my query, basically I have this uh, little red point that it's the query ID, check if a sentence can be read backwards, or or the what the computer, what the algorithms understood from my query, that is that vector. And we have here a piece of code or the vector uh, that the computer understood for that piece of code, that is the result for my query. And in this space, what I can do is actually measure distance. I can measure distance as it does distance where, uh, where the semantic distance between two concepts. So I can compare pieces of information that are different, text and code in this case, in a semantic way, and I can give you the result of that query. I will do just another search just for you to have the, the grasp of this. Uh, and again, as Guido mentioned, this is a pretty useful tool where when you, know, when you have large teams, when you have a lot of uh, people that is uh, newcomers, for example, starting the projects, or you have a lot of information, a, lot, a big code basis that the developers have to interact with, and you can basically interact with that code base using concepts and not just strict words. So another search, for example, check if a sentence is long. I love this example because it's like, it actually shows the power of the, of the language model. Again, I'm doing something, I'm expressing something that I want, a functionality that I want. And the most relevant function that I found here is a word count. Basically, an, a little algorithm, a little piece of code that is counting the words in a string. Of course, it's checking how long that sentence is. It's, it's, we, are, we are bringing that functionality into code. Um, but I want, what I want to highlight here is that this piece of code is not documented. It has no Java doc, nothing. So I want to highlight that this kind of systems, this kind of AI, it works even if the code is not documented because we are not using the documentation. The algorithms are not using the documentation. The, the algorithms are actually understanding the concept and the functionality behind that code from the code itself. 
again, if you know, if, if you, we do the same analysis and the same representation of code, it will happen the same. You know, you have the, the, the your query, the representation of your query, check if a sentence is long, and the closest results are these couple of word counts that are basically the same code doing the same. So this is the power of this kind of language models. And we are, again, we are still not generating anything. We are just understanding, you know, bringing an AI that can understand all the code, understand the daily normal queries from my developers and matching them together with the existing code. We will jump now to the generation part uh, because that's the, the second and third demo are uh, generative. So let's move to that world uh, and start with code completion, you know, deep learning code completion. As Guido mentioned, this is something that is working together with the developer. You know, every time the developer presses a stroke, a stroke, a key, uh, there's um, triggers the algorithm of code generation. And the thing is that our generation, you know, the generation using deep learning is quite different from the generation that is coming from the IDE. The IDE typically gives you some options, you know, given the, I don't know, the properties of an object, the operations, the typical operations that I could do with a, with a variable of a certain type or something like that. We want to go a little bit farther from that. We want to understand, and I'm using again the same word, understand um, the context of the developer, what the developer is creating with the code and complete as much code as possible. One word, two words, the complete line, etc. So that's the, the idea. There was a, a question that Guido already answered in the Q&A section that it's um, about the difference between this and algorithms, for example, GPT-3 that are, you know, uh, uh, trained with a lot of code, uh, a lot of uh, text, sorry, and they start to complete, you know, rudimentary, complete little pieces of code. Yeah, it's, it's a valid comparison, uh, but the thing is that uh, when you do a uh, code understanding and code generation algorithms, uh, you will have to uh, be pretty much focused on the, not just the, the algorithm, but the data uh, and uh, um, training an algorithm with uh, unlabeled, uh, unorganized data. It, it will never have the same results as training an algorithm with um, uh, correct data, clean data, uh, so we can actually generate things that make sense in the context of each and every developer. Uh, but it's a very good question. And the algorithm, the family of algorithms are the same. So um, just uh, a couple of metrics that we measure when we plan these algorithms with our developers. Um, we found, uh, let's say, a very low level metric that we found is like developers, they press 46% less keystrokes. And this is not that we are worried about the health of the keyboards, but uh, this is a very low met uh, low level metric that we can measure, and that impacts in a 17% time reduction for code development. And that's the important metric we see when you when you, we use this kind of algorithms. So let's jump to the to, the, to a little demo. I will show this uh, with with an IDE, and then we mute the audio. Um, what we will see here, it's a person basically interacting with the, the IDE and getting, I will just leave the video, but just for you to know, um, you will see uh, options coming from the IDE in white and options coming from our algorithms in blue. Uh, if, you can, if you want to see all these videos in detail and have more information about this, they are all in our webpage, unwentedcoding.com. I will uh, remember that uh, in a moment. But just for you to know, this is what is happening when a developer is coding with our algorithms and they are receiving, a, let's say, quite big pieces of information while they are coding, you know, big uh, function names, uh, correct uh, variables for the, for the, um, for the completing those functions uh, and stuff like that. And, and the thing is that while you are coding, the algorithms try uh, to adapt to your context. So the more you code, the more context the algorithm has to give a correct prediction of the code you need. 
Uh, again, I invite you to see more detail about this functionality in our web page. And let me go to the last but not least functionality. And this is the most experimental thing we have, and it's the generation of documentation. As Guido mentioned, you know, this is a very harsh task. Uh, developers, they don't like to document code. Um, and the thing is that uh, when, you, when you have tight deadlines uh, and the project is, is burning, you have to build code, the code has to work, it has a lot of bugs. So sometimes, you know, documenting code is sometimes neglected, you know, you, you leave this task for the, you know, the end of the sprint or the next sprint and, and you never do it. Um, so what we can do here is actually use the same concept of understanding, but decoding that information into proper code documentation. And that's the things we are we are doing. We basically integrated those kind of algorithms with the IDE. So developers, they just have to right click on the piece of code they, they want to document and receive a piece of documentation as an output. And again, I want to highlight this algorithm is generative. Uh, this piece of documentation, it's not like we are searching for the best documentation for this code. We are actually generating the documentation for that piece of code in a way that we understand the code and we decode that understanding into a piece of text in English. Let's say let's see the same uh, the same demo for that. In this case, there's a there's a piece of code there. The, the user will right click, um, infer the documentation, and we'll get phrases like this. Gets the instance of the I analytics style, for example, like this. Or, or you will see some others happening in other in other pieces of code. Again, you may see more examples and more information about this functionality in our web page in augmentedcoding.com. Um, and again, something that I forgot to say, but there's both uh, the code generation algorithms and the code documentation algorithms are available for not just for Java, but for C -Jarp, uh, for JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, and other languages. Uh, and this is the way we are working with this. We are trying to learn from different programming languages and be able to build this kind of algorithms. So first of all, uh, I want to, uh, let me tackle a couple of final thoughts, but I, I, I think Guido is a more informed word to say this, but from, uh, at least from the technical perspective, this is a quite challenging uh, problem. And I saw another question coming, the talking about no code platforms, low code platforms, you know, uh, from the code generation perspective, you know, generating a piece of code, a working piece of code, um, just from the description of what I need that code to do is a pretty hard problem, an open problem in the academic world. There has been a lot of uh, advances and, and studies in the last years, but it's an open problem and it's not something easy. You know, there's a huge distance between the way we as humans express ideas with a lot of holes in, in our semantics and in the way we express the, the things we need and the way we need to express those ideas in a way that computers can execute those tasks. And that, that's the challenge, you know, moving from a very high level semantic uh, incomplete language to a very, let's say, low level syntactical uh, and, and very complete and strict language. And, and that's the things we are trying to solve, you know, shorten that gap between, uh, between those two languages. I know, Guido, if you want to say some words uh, as, as final thoughts. Yes, and of course. then we can go to the to the Q and A. Yes, of course. Like uh, just to wrap up, um, okay, we, we show you three demos of the things that we have already in production. We have many others that are there in the pipeline that have to do with um, uh, code op op optimization and uh, reviewing pieces of of code. We have a long list of things that are being uh, passing from research and proof of concepts into uh, production, like uh, pipeline. What is interesting here to observe is that when when you start having these tools and they interoperate between each other, you have a much powerful overall platform to solving and tackling the problems I mentioned before. Just to mention something like 
if we solve, for instance, uh, when we, we address the problem of uh, documentation, we are tackling uh, the problem of legacy, code generation, migrations, uh, quality control overall. And the, that is helping as well uh, the part of the semantic search, because when you have better documented code, semantic search, even when it doesn't need that documentation, uh, you can add that part to it. And that's what we are doing. And you, you start improving the overall ecosystem of uh, the entire code base and the way you work inside of a corporation. Uh, so like, but in a high level, augmented coding, uh, just to, to uh, summarize the thing, uh, augmented coding is, is something entirely different for our customers. Uh, it goes at the core of their transformation, uh, which is the developers themselves. Uh, from the inside out, we are trying to rethink, and we are doing that actually, the way they work, and we propose solutions to their problems. We, we are very sure that this propagates into all the big problems of our companies. Um, and this is the point, I mean, by attacking the root, we will impact uh, several of the big problems. Uh, and these problems are many of the problems are keeping them from evolving at, at a much past, uh, faster pace, basically. So that's why we're, we're very excited about the work we are doing, uh, which is actually uh, moving. I mean, we're doing research and we're moving actually to the real world and real products. With that, I, I think uh, we can answer some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Guido. Uh, it was, this was a a fascinating session. We will love to talk about this, to talk about AI, to talk about uh, the things that are happening around AI for code that are many today. Uh, and thank you again, Guido, for, for sharing your, your insights. It's uh, it's now time for, for Q&A. We have received some uh, questions during the presentation that, um, you know, Guido just answered using test, text. Sorry, just a reminder to everyone, uh, if you have any questions to myself or Guido, it's, it's the time now to, to send them uh, through the Q&A box on Zoom. Uh, we have, we, we love to, to you know, start the conversation and having questions. Um, we have a first quest, uh, question from uh, Paul and I will uh, give you Guido the word for this one. Uh, and the question is, uh, what is the licensing model uh, for this uh, capability? Oh, um, so right now with all the, the, the customers we are, or in an early stage, but all the, the customers that decide to use us, uh, actually, uh, we provide them the, um, the tools for a six month period. We're working very close to them. So we adapt to their needs and we keep, we keep evolving with them after a six month period. And the, after six months, uh, we agree in a payment method, uh, which is um, a flat fee. We do it very simply, it's a flat, flat fee. So that's uh, how it works. And in terms of licensing, I mean, the things that we build with your code and the outcomes of those things are, are, are basically yours, it's, it's your code. The things that we pro provide generically, I mean, that for, from our databases and our code, uh, they belong to us. So that's why you have a, a flat fee. Thank you, Guido. There, there's another question uh, that I think we, we both can tackle. And the question is, uh, Tom is saying, uh, I like the concept. I think it, it is definitely the way forward, uh, but how this compete right now, for example, with Stack Overflow, which also gives the developers con context around the answers rather than just the code itself. It is something you want to bring in. Let me just quickly jump to that question and I will let Guido um, give his insights, but uh, just a little thing about, you know, Stack Overflow, also GitHub and some other bases that you will see around public bases, but basically uh, that are the heart of the, you know, the, when, when a developer have a doubt, uh, they typically go to Stack Overflow. Uh, and the thing is that when you are in a strict um, uh, enterprise environment, sometimes uh, you don't have access to those kind of tools such as Stack Overflow or others. Um, and this is just, you know, the, the, the tip of the iceberg, but this is something that we have seen in our clients. Another thing is that Stack Overflow, it's a pretty good basis for general understanding of programming languages. But when you go to, uh, you know, understanding the specifics of a business need, 
um, the the only or the only way the way we are doing that understanding is to actually move the intelligence to the code that needs to be understood and these algorithms can understand uh, domain specific code and that's the idea we can bring the same ideas behind the semantic search to the domain specific and that's why we are you know working with our clients uh, to let's say adapt the intelligence we have to the specific needs for each context each clients and so then the algorithms can actually um, answer questions from a domain specific perspective and that's another difference from stack overflow i don't know Gide, if you want to um, to add something to that yeah we see we see some efforts uh, out there that are quite well known etc and uh, and they are like working as silos but Stack Overflow is, uh, works very well. I mean, it's the most uh, uh, access where if you have the rights within the company and you have a, a, a internal uh, Stack Overflow version, let's say one of the most uh, uh, used ones out, out there to find pieces of code with comments, etc. has to do much more, I think, with um, this uh, shared economy kind of style things when, when everybody collaborates to comment and put pieces of code. Now, in, in our case, we are going more for the intelligence part. That's one of the things. Uh, the other thing is uh, we want really to please our customers. So we work very, very close to our customers, with, with our customers to adapt to their needs, not in every way possible, but within our scope of um, uh, I mean, of, of freedom to do something as generic enough to be put in another uh, or used in another uh, customer, but with some perks here and there that will be tailored to them. And well, the third thing come back to, uh, to I would say is come back to the first one, which is that in our case, what we're trying to do is uh, integrating many of efforts out there for uh, code optimization. And by doing that integration and communication between the, the components, let's say, or, or the parts, uh, it's much easier to have a, a global solution uh, and not just focusing on one, which is a semantic search or that complete or uh, this other thing. And, and we start finding interesting things that we never thought about. Like, for instance, by using our semantic search, you can find uh, like that you need to refactor pieces of code. Uh, that's something you don't do with something like Stack Overflow, for instance, uh, at, at least to the best of my knowledge of, of what we have doing, been doing. Because the fact that you're doing a, a semantic query, we bring you pieces of code that function in the functionality of that code respond to that query. And there you find out uh, in many cases that there are snippets that were not just repeated here and there everywhere, but also that are written, they have the same functionality written in a different way. So very quickly you can identify that something there needs to be refactored. I don't know if that answers the question. Thanks, uh, thanks Guido. Uh, we have another question coming from, uh, from Paul. Uh, and it's a pretty good one. It's a very informed question. It says, how much does the semantic encoding rely on a meaningful uh, function names or variable names, you know, uh, or it's more like an understanding of what the code is actually doing inside the functions. Again, I will briefly tackle that from the technical perspective. Um, it's a very good question because this is something that actually happens, you know, when you train an algorithm uh, with pieces of code, um, you have to be very careful on the things that the algorithm is actually paying attention to. Uh, and if you find this kind of behavior, and we have found that kind of behavior, and that's why I said it's a pre-informed question, uh, you have to work on making the algorithms uh, a little bit stronger and more robust uh, than that. Uh, so what we we typically follow, you know, um, normal techniques to um, uh, remove some part of the information while training or generating new examples uh, with uh, changes uh, with, you know, proper changes. So the algorithm can actually start paying attention to other things and not just the function names and variable names. In fact, we don't work only, only with uh, the words, the tokens from the code. We work with other structures coming from the code. So we make sure that the algorithm, they don't, don't only pay attention to function names or variable names, and they also pay attention to structures, to paths in the code, uh, and to other things that can give the algorithms 
even more information than just the function name or uh, and variable names, and they are more robust um, to changes in those in those parameters. Guido, I don't know if you want to add something to that. Yeah, well, I, I think it's very, very interesting, this question. It come back, comes back to uh, one of the first ones about using GPT-3 or generic off-shelf uh, models. Uh, in general, what you do is like, when you have a generic thing, it's not tailored to a particular problem. And the effort and the amount of brains you have to put in, in understanding the domain uh, of the problem is quite, uh, it's quite uh, consuming. I mean, more knowledge you have about the problem, more you can add into your own ad hoc algorithms to tackle uh, the problem in a more effective and um, uh, in a better way, actually, because you have smaller models that are actually solving the problem in a better way. So you, you keep optimizing the models in that case. Uh, but that has to do a lot with, with the amount of data you have, the, the exact problem you're trying to solve, et cetera, et cetera. So this question is excellent because of that, is, is how do you find the good balances between what where you pay attention in the, uh, in the problem or, or in the data of the problem you're trying to solve? And that's something we are actively working and adding uh, tools for learn, like tools for building the tool basically uh, we have attention models we have uh, automatic ways of paying attention in some case in some cases when we know uh, that it's something that will be repeated everywhere we need to add those that knowledge by hand because we understand the domain uh, thank you again Guido and thank you for for, for the people that that had joined um this was an, an extraordinary time we love again to to share this time uh, with you uh i need to bring uh, this session uh, to a close as we almost reached the end of our time uh before doing so remember we will be sharing the recording of these sessions in the next uh, few days uh, and again before leaving let me thank you to everyone for taking the, the time uh, to shine today um if uh, if you have any any final comments? Uh, it's it's the, the time today if you want to share something with the audience with. Uh, Guido, also, if you want to share something with our audience before leaving, the time is now uh, and before we, we close. Now, I, I want to say thank you everyone to be in there and to uh, lending us a little bit of your time to pay attention to what we have to say. And we are very excited about this project. I hope we were able to transmit that to you as well. And uh, well, I look forward to hearing from you at some point in the future. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Guido, once again. And uh, thank you for your time. Goodbye. Thank you.